Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Bruce Gosper, a Vice President at the Asian Development Bank, and I'm very pleased to join you for this important seminar on ADB's results-based approach to delivering finance to achieve our corporate strategy and the Sustainable Development Goals. The bank's Strategy 2030 sets out the vision for a prosperous, resilient and inclusive Asia and the Pacific. The seven operational priorities under Strategy 2030 focus on pressing development challenges in the region that reflect and align with all 17 SDGs. The annual Development Effectiveness Review assesses ADB's performance towards achieving Strategy 2030 based on the bank's Corporate Results Framework, or CRF. CRF is the management tool that tracks and monitors ADB's progress in implementing its corporate strategy. The 2021 Development Effectiveness Review is the 15th in a series of yearly reports that monitor development progress in Asia and the Pacific. This process enables ADB to analyze emerging trends in corporate effectiveness, identify underlying issues, leverage opportunities for synergies, and develop actions to strengthen its performance. Findings on development effectiveness help inform ADB's <coughs> operational directions and resource planning for the coming period. And these are reflected in the President's planning directions the three-year corporate work program and budget framework. The development effectiveness review is essential for ADB to measure and understand how well it's performing against its strategic goals and targets, which directly impacts its developing member countries and attainment of the SDGs in the region. The 2022 annual general meeting of our Board of Governors takes place during a period of interlinked global crises related to health, energy, food, climate change, and the economy. While these crises obviously pose a challenge to the prospects for achieving the ambitious SDG agenda, they illustrate the value of the SDGs as a comprehensive and holistic approach to development. These realities are discussed in the key messages of the 2021 Development Effectiveness Review. For a meaningful discussion, we bring together a diverse set of perspectives to reflect on ADB's performance in 2021 within a challenging regional and global context. We are honoured to welcome Kaveh Zahidi, Deputy Executive Secretary of SCAP, Mark Miller, Director of Program Development and Public Finance at ODI, and Lu Shen, the Director of ADB's Results Management and Aid Effectiveness Division. Our focal point on both our corporate approach to results management and the SDGs. And she will first present the key findings of the 2021 Development Effectiveness Review. Then together, they will discuss, our panelists will discuss our performance in achieving our strategic priorities, our response to challenges and the opportunities ADB can take to enhance our effectiveness. We want to understand your views, of course, so please use the pigeonhole software to pose your questions to the panel as we go along. And we'll have an interactive discussion around your questions after we hear from the panel. Now, for those of you who are not used to pigeonhole live, um, it's a simple interactive mobile website where you can submit questions to the panel speakers. And you can also vote on any questions that interest you. If you're watching us live, all you need to do is click the Q&A icon on the right side of the page, and it will direct you to the session's Q&A se section. If you have a smartphone or a tablet, you may scan the QR codes you see on the screen, or just launch your internet browser and enter www.pigeonhole.at into the address bar. Next, key in your event passcode, which is ADBMNL55. Once again, ADB MNL 55. If you have any questions throughout the panel discussion, feel free to submit them through Pigeonhole. Questions with the highest number of votes will stand a better chance to be answered by your speakers, of course. So with that, um, welcome again. And let me 
pose the first question, the first polling question for, for you all to address. And the question is, how optimistic are you about the prospects of achieving the SDGs in the current global context? A, do you believe the SDGs are still relevant and achievable? B, the SDGs are still relevant but have become much more difficult to achieve? Or C, the SDGs seem unattainable at this point, but they keep critical issues on the agenda and provide a common accountability framework. So while you respond to that question, um, and we'll give it a minute for some numbers to appear, um, let me just tell you that uh, unfortunately we had hoped that um, Rosemary Adilion, the Under Secretary of National Economic and Development Authority, or NIDA, of the Philippines, would be able to join us for this session as well. And many of you would have seen her name on the program. Unfortunately, of course, there's been a cabinet meeting called um, this morning, and Rosemary's been called away to that, uh, so she won't be able to join us. Um, but we do have a very good panel, Kave and Mark, and uh, Lu Shen will also help us um, with uh, setting out some context with the ADB's um, report to begin with. So while we wait a moment for the initial poll results to come in, and here we have some numbers. Um, so uh, clearly what they're telling us is that the SDGs um, are relevant, but they have become more difficult. More than half of you have said um, they're still relevant, but have become much more difficult to achieve. Um, and a good number of you um, have said they seem unattainable at this point. So this is an important uh, uh, perception that no doubt reflects the increasing challenges that we face because of these interlinked crisis, crises. So with that, um, perhaps we can move on to our first um, session. And as I said, Lu Shen, who here at the ADB is Director of Results Management and Aid Effectiveness, We'll talk to us a little bit about um, the work uh, that ADB has done and the report. So if I can, over to you, please, Lucien. Thank you, VP Bruce, um, for the introductions and lovely to have you as well as the panel members here for this very interesting discussion, hopefully. Um, first of all, just wanted to kind of um, get into this Thing about the development and effectiveness review. So um, this is our annual scorecard. And um, because at ADB, we are fascinated and we love acronyms, and you will hear a lot more of them during the presentation, we refer to the development and effectiveness review as a DFR. So as the title slide ind indicates, uh, this is really how we keep track of our, how ADB as an institution is faring and delivering towards our strategy 2030 goals, right? And, um, but more broadly, how are we delivering towards the SDGs? Next slide. So very interesting results from the polling question. And uh, I see that many of you uh, agree with me um, in terms of uh, the, 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 the the fact that the path towards SDG attainment is becoming even more uh, tough as a result of the pandemic and in its current uh, environment. So the Asia Pacific region is no exception to this. In fact, uh, we had already been off track uh, well before the COVID pan pandemic, um, but, but now we are only uh, not only seeing um, a further slowdown of progress towards the SDGs. In some areas, as we can see, there's actual backsliding uh, in key areas such as climate action or life below water. In 2021, we also had the additional political and economic turmoil that uh, some countries in the region had experienced, which have exacerbated the situation further. Next slide. So every year for the DFR, we try to develop some key messages and key headlines that crystallize the main messages that we want to convey as, as, as an institution. So with the scene setting from the previous slide, we felt that the following sums up some of the key takeaways, right? 
from, uh, from uh, in terms of the main theme uh, for this year's DFR. And that's namely progress implementing strategy 2030 in tumultuous times and accelerations needed towards uh, key targets to support uh, recovery as well as the SDGs. So we feel that this headline really captures well both the achievements uh, that we have made during very difficult times, but also recognizing the challenges that we have uh, to face uh, in years to come. So today's presentation that we have put together only focuses on a few of the key priority areas that we cover under the DFR. I won't subject you to the 60 indicators that we actually report on, but in case of anybody is interested, we actually launched the first ever digital scorecard for the results uh, for the corporate results framework and the, uh, and and all 60 indicators. So you can find that information very handy and easily on our website. Next slide. So. The, the first aspect that I wanted to cover, um, it's about ADB's intervention during the COVID pandemic, right? And so I, I think some of the things that really stand out about this is ADB's ability to help our developing member countries or DMCs cope with the various aspects of the crisis uh, and also do it in a very timely basis. Um, so whether we're talking about ensuring that sustainability or providing access to vaccines or investing in resilience for future crises or rebuilding livelihoods, I, I, I think one of the things that we wanted to highlight was that ADB's COVID pandemic response option or CPRO instrument um, really had a very wide ranging uh, set of benefits that we have provided to the people as well as the businesses across Asia and the Pacific. So in total, we had a, a committed 29.8 uh, billion uh, under the CPRO instrument and 13.5 billion of this was committed in 2021. And this is really reflecting the evol evolving needs of our DMCs to a certain extent, but also reflects the uh, ability for ADB to be, be agile in meeting those needs. Next slide. So an illustration of the CPRO in action is in fact the COVID-19 active response and expenditure support facility. Um, this is again another acronym. It's called CARES for short, the CARES program uh, in the Philippines. So it's really unfortunate that Under Secretary Edion is unable to join us, but the CARES program is a great example of how ADB support during time of a crisis um, for both the population in the form of conditional cash transfers, as well as emergency subsidies, as well as to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in the form of wage subsidies and tax relief. As you will note, the support for these enterprises is very broad-based, and so we have really taken into account some of the key sectors of the economy that is specific and relevant to the Philippines. Next slide. So another key priority for ADB it's progress towards gender equality. And this is, for me, a very, very consistent one for us for a very long time, but also a very, very important one. So we're really happy to report that we're well on track to incorporate gender into our projects um, in, a, in, a, in a comprehensive manner. And 72% of our projects uh, processed within the last year uh, had effective gender mainstreaming. And then over a three-year rolling period, 96% per of our programs have uh, incorporated gender equity uh, to various degrees into their projects. However, women's economic empowerment, as we well know, has been further threatened by the pandemic, um, with many estimates suggesting that they are at a higher risk of being pushed back into poverty 
given that they already are not quite part of the um, formal economy in terms of participation, and they have borne a higher share of the burden of un um, unpaid care. So this is a really something that we are uh, conscious of and we're trying to address. Next slide. So a good example of, of uh, advancing gender equity during the pandemic is the CARES program, same name, but this time in the Kyrgyz Republic. Um, in this program, we focus our effort uh, to support women through various channels, uh, including targeted interventions for the very vulnerable households within the country, providing health and safety equipment for essential workers, and also um, providing support for women-led um, micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. Next slide. So during the pandemic, economic growth in the region contracted for the first time in more than 60 years and millions of people. And this morning I was listening to another session under the AGM and our um, chief economist was referring to the, the, the ballpark of 75 to 80 million um, people who are being pushed back under the poverty line or near into near poverty. And so and this is a very conservative uh, estimate. Right. And and the number in actuality could be a lot higher. So during the pandemic, while the health financing uh, came as a necessary focal uh, point for ADB in supporting our DMCs, and this is reflected by the fact that it re represented over 30 percent of our commitments in 2021, we, we also did not forget Right, or neglect our investments in other key areas, uh, such as education and social protection, because we feel that these really form a very integral part of the pillar for mitigation and recovery. And so this is something that we're always keeping uh, in our minds when we're thinking about our portfolio and the way forward. Next slide. So, um, climate finance, um, I, I think the key message here is that we are off track um, from our interim target that we have set for ourselves in, by 2024 to achieve 35 billion. So, and this is not surprising to a certain extent because this comes at a time when our DMCs are facing the difficult trade-offs, right, between coping with the immediate threats that the temp pandemic has, has caused and the multiple threats, uh, both immediate as well as pending, that climate change imposes, right? It, this is not an easy path, but at the end of the day, we think that this is a very necessary one. And to this end, ADB is not only not shying away from the challenge, uh, in fact, we have raised uh, the ambition for climate finance from 80 billion um, to 100 billion by 2030. So, of course, this will require a very concerted effort across the bank to ensure that we're engaged with the DMCs in dialogue, um, but more importantly, provide the appropriate tools and modalities that would benefit for the purpose of, um, um, of, of achieving this target. Next slide. So you may ask, okay, it's all well and good to talk about things, but what specifically are you doing? So, so these are some of the specific act actions that uh, are being taken throughout the uh, the bank, and um, and this is being currently formulated and synthesized under our climate change action plan, which is ongoing. So the first thing I wanted to highlight was the fact that we have committed to have a to have a hundred percent of our sovereign operations adhere to the common MDB uh, principles for alignment with the Paris Agreement, right? And this deadline is actually June of next year. So we're tracking this very closely and have been pleased to see uh, a lot of progress in terms of the method methodology development, as well as the guidelines that are being developed for our operations. And this is all very important in order to operationalize the, the, the commitment by middle of next year. Second, we have embarked on a journey to accelerate decarbonization 
through innovations such as the energy transition mechanism, right? So, or as we like to call it, ETM. And so the, the, the concept of ETM is really to finance expedited phasing out of the coal usage uh, across the region. And it's a very interesting uh, initiative. And currently the pilots are being uh, implemented uh, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, as well as in Vietnam. And we hope to be able to collect some of the lessons learned uh, from the early stages from these pilots to really enhance the modality for a broader application um, in many of our other DMCs uh, in the region. Thirdly, we are looking at ways uh, to promote uh, just transitions and nature positive approaches to climate action in our DMCs. Uh, of course, the circumstances and opportunities, as you can imagine, vary greatly from country to country. And we adhere to the country-based approach, which form, forms a very key uh, principle under our strategy 2030 to ensure that we're choosing the best solutions and the most apt solutions uh, for each of the countries that we work with. And last, but certainly not the least, we're mo mobilizing financing through facilities such as the Community Resilience Financing Partnerships Facility to deepen our focus on climate risk as well as resilience. Next slide. So another example, so we're experimenting with new modalities and approaches to tackle the climate challenge. And this is a good example, again, from the Philippines on the utilization of uh, policy-based lending or PBL um, that, that, that really uh, exemplifies how we're uh, looking at the broadening, broadening of our toolbox. So the Climate Change Action Program in the Philippines, it's a $250 million policy-based uh, loan. And we obtained $172 million in co-financing from the Agence Française uh, de Développement. So, and this program really targets the policy reforms that will help the Philippine government uh, build, ba uh, build better planning, financing, and institutional systems uh, to help them scale up climate action. Um, it will support reforms to enhance the resilience of farming and fishing. And these are two of uh, very important um, basis for, for the economy to increase the impact of the climate change agenda. And it will help uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions through deployment, deployment of uh, renewable energy, of energy efficiency, as well as sustainable transport. Next slide. So under strategy 2030, we really recognize and acknowledge the importance of harnessing private sector financing, right? In order to deliver on this broad SDG agenda in the, in the Asia Pacific region. So um, as far as our uh, targets and, and achievements go, we're happy to report that the share of private sector financing in the ADB's portfolio have increased to 27%. And uh, this is in, in line with the trajectory for us to reach the 33% target um, by 2024. The co-financing ratio has also increased uh, to 180%, and it's also well in track to meet the 200% um, target by 2024. Uh, the other part that we wanted to emphasize for private sector operations is the uh, focus on frontier economies as well as new sectors. Uh, and these two have increased to 23% and 49% respectively uh, last year. Um, lastly, and very importantly, uh, we have launched an ex ante development effectiveness tool uh, that's specific for the private sector operations to ensure that we have alignment uh, of our development goals and overall impact and additionality that the private sector operations offer. Next slide. So private sector investments, as you can imagine, take on very different forms. And uh, we wanted to highlight one particular one in Georgia. And this is an affordable housing project where we try to address the prevailing uh, development challenges 
related to um, the lack of sustainable urban housing uh, in the capital city where uh, you were, were, were wrestling with uh, several uh, challenges like affordability, like energy efficiency, uh, safety and accessibility. And so the project is interesting in the fact that it accommodates for the elderly, it accommodates for the, uh, the disabled, uh, women and children, and really incorporates some of the basic and fundamental principles uh, of livable and inclusive city guidelines. So really interesting project, and we're doing a lot more in this aspect. Next slide. So after all, some of the good news of delivering, um, we. I just wanted to focus on some of the things that are still uh, remain uh, as a work in progress. So project su a success rating for, for completed projects. Uh, this is definitely an area that we're seeking constant re-improvement. So 70% of our sovereign projects are rated successful and uh, versus only 55% of non-sovereign projects. Um, the overall rating are disaggregated uh, into four areas for, for each. Um, and as you can see on the sovereign side, sustainability uh, is an area that's rated the lowest, while the relevance is the highest, uh, whereas additionality, development results, and ADB work quality are equally trailing behind profitability for the non-sovereign operations. So the adoption of the ex ante uh, development and effectiveness tool that I mentioned a couple of slides back, it's really a, a direct response to improve how we um, select and monitor our investments um, in the private sector. For sovereign operations, uh, strengthening the attention to sustainability uh, in project design and implementation uh, is definitely amongst our priorities um, that, that we're, we're working with uh, in conjunction with our operational departments as well as non-operational departments. So this is obviously uh, accompanied by uh, the development of some of our sector and thematic guidance and guidance, guidance notes uh, under uh, under our sector and thematic groups, uh, as well as the operational plan updates uh, that we're currently doing for the seven operational priorities under strategy 2030. And these collective uh, guidelines will help us um, establish a more specific roadmap um, towards better performance and, um, and, and, and improved performance, quite frankly. So, and lastly, just wanted to mention that the organizational review that's ongoing at the moment uh, aims to really strengthen ADB's ability to deliver financing and knowledge through our programming um, and to better respond to client needs in a more efficient manner. And so I think that kind of organizational structural and non-structural changes will also help us uh, with this agenda. Next slide. So instead of looking back, which is what the annual scorecard is doing, I just wanted to also uh, look ahead a little bit and um, look at some of the things that we will be focusing on for the next year's uh, uh, annual review or DFR. So. As we look ahead, we see the challenge of coping with compounding crises. And so the triple threat that's posed by climate, by COVID, by conflict, as well as the food, fuel, and finance nexus issues are some of the areas that really make us rethink how we can provide the most appropriate um, interventions for our DMCs. So thus far, we have endeavored to provide um, relevant assistance, such as emergency and counter-cyclical financing to help countries uh, deal with some of these challenges in Central Asia, as well as in South Asia. We're strengthening our focus on social inclusion, including scaling up um, education and social protection finance to ensure the inclusion of the most vulnerable so that no one's left behind. We're also continuing our effort to deepen the focus on SDGs at the country level through targeted country uh, level uh, engagement as well as program design. But at the end of the day, the key message I want to leave you with is that there's uh, a lot left to be done. Uh, 
um, and as the regional development uh, development bank for the Asia and the Pacific, we continue to strive to better serve our DMCs through lessons learned from past uh, projects, uh, through innovation uh, from our current projects, through knowledge sharing and through cl close collaboration with our partners and with our counterparts. So with that, I thank you for your attention and I wanted to pass the floor back to Chair. Thank you, Lou. Um, and thank you for that context. Um, so um, for our audience, the response to our first polling question um, really highlighted uh, the fact that the SDGs are becoming more difficult to uh, attain. And I think Lou's given us an interesting insight into how ADB is responding to that, the innovation it's seeking to apply in a number of areas, uh, and the increasing complexity uh, and interlinkages between many of the issues that it faces. So um, now we might turn to our second polling question. Um, and the question is this, how important are multilateral development banks in helping countries navigate these compounding crises? A, highly relevant and responsive, B, somewhat relevant and responsive, or C, relevant, but their effectiveness needs to be strengthened. So please go to pigeonhole once again to indicate your view on these three questions. Um, Lou, thank you um, while we wait for those results. Um, thank you for um, that presentation. Quite sobering on a number of issues, in particular gender. Um, so women have felt the burden of the pandemic um, quite severely. And, um, and uh, it's good to see that ADB is responding to that. You mentioned 96% mainstreaming in projects. I understand, in fact, that that figure is now moved up to 100% but so much more work to, to be done on, uh, on supporting uh, gender inclusiveness and, uh, and uh, advancement um, uh, in, in the region. And the pandemic has really put, put us back on that score considerably, both in terms of inclusion in employment opportunities, but also violence and, uh, and, and other impacts of one sort or another. So um, we're waiting for those responses to our second polling question hopefully not too far away, and then we can move on to our next speaker, um, who will be joining us from um, Bangkok. So this is interesting. Um, I think uh, a lot of support there for the uh, point that the development banks are highly relevant and responsive, um, but equally uh, almost as many people suggesting that the effectiveness of the banks um, need to be strengthened. Um, to perhaps that's an indication of, a, of an awareness of the compounding and interlinked crises that we face uh, and the intensification of some of those challenges uh, in the time ahead. So um, thank you for those responses, but now perhaps we can move on. Now, I think as we've heard, the region's prospects for achieving the SDGs are substantially compromised by the pandemic and the ensuing economic and security crises. Yet the extent to which countries have placed the SDGs at the heart of their development efforts and prioritise issues such as climate action and environmental sustainability has varied substantially. In principle, these crises create new opportunities to reshape the region's energy, food and financial systems. So, um, Kabe Sahedi, uh, joining us from SCAP um, in, in Bangkok, could, could we invite your thoughts on this challenge and the role that the multilaterals can play in helping advance the SDGs through their financing operations in um, the DMCs? Uh, Kebe, please, over to you. Thank you so much, Bruce. And, and again, thank you for inviting me to, to, to join you in, in, in this session. Uh, I, I really enjoyed watching you know, uh, and, lo and looking at the, the presentation that Lu Shen made uh, as well. Um, I, th I think, you know, in a way, the starting point has to be a recognition of, of, of you know, the, the time that we find ourselves in. Uh, the, the managing director of, of the IMF recently said that we're living in an era of shocks. And, and I think that is going to be def have to define uh, all of the ways we work, our portfolios. Um, 
because the pandemic, the war, energy, food, the fast unfolding sort of cost of living crises, uh, you saw you saw many of those in, in, in Lou's uh, last slide as well. Uh, all of these are happening uh, at the same time as this ever-present backdrop of, of climate change and, and frankly, it's terrifying impacts. Uh, so without a, a really fundamental shift, that, that quite sad trajectory of SDG progress that, that was shown uh, at, the, at the start of, of, of the last uh, presentation is unlikely to improve in, in the seven years that remain for delivering the 2030 uh, agenda. I mean, that SDG progress, uh, when we did that SDG progress that, that, that Lucien uh, kindly projected as well, uh, it, it, uh, it, the estimation was that it would take the region until 2065 to achieve the SDGs. And, 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 and frankly, that's just not good enough, especially when such critical ones like climate action are moving in the wrong direction. Now, it, it is important to take stock of where we find ourselves now because many of the Asia-Pacific economies are, of course, net importers of oil and food, and they're going to bear the brunt of raising rising prices. Uh, we know that half of our, our, our countries in Asia-Pacific, low-income countries, they're also facing the high risk of public and external uh, debt distress. So, so the, the, the crisis, uh, in a way, unraveling in, 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 in countries like Pakistan is, is a case in point, right? Responding to the climate-induced disasters, preparing for all the related diseases, the food shortages, trying to implement an IMF program and dealing with debt distress all at the same time. But this seems to, 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 uh, to, to becoming sort of the new reality. The cascading crises or shocks are, are in a way defining the development trajectory and, and choices of many countries in Asia Pacific. I mean, countries are frankly lurching from crisis uh, to crisis, from shock to shock, with little uh, political or financial space for any kind of long-term investments needed to deliver on that resilient, inclusive, sustainable development that is the, the promise of the, of the 2030 uh, agenda. And of course, many of these crises are, are, are resulting in tighter budgets, debt issues, and, and, and to deal with the, the, the financing pressures, governments uh, end up choosing some sort of fiscal consolidation, basically scaling back spending on what is most important, on healthcare, on education, on social protection, with, with pretty disastrous results for poverty and for, for inequality. And this was really clear after the last financial crisis, right? In the years that followed, we saw that the 1% the, 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 the GDP, GDP sort of fiscal austerity had knock-on effects of, of over 1.5% one, one increases in income inequality, just to mention one indicator. But, but, but it, is, it is quite a fundamental setback for that SDG uh, agenda. And it seems, unfortunately, Bruce, that, that, again, in a similar vein, the opportunity of building back better that came with, with the COVID pandemic is, 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 is a little bit lost in Asia Pacific because investments in polluting industries dominated the fiscal stimulus packages in many of the countries that we reviewed last year. And very few, a small percentage of the response uh, was, was gender sensitive. You mentioned that uh, a, a moment ago in terms of how important it is, even though the women face disproportionate impacts of the pandemic. I mean, what does this mean uh, for, for us and especially for multilaterals, especially for, 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 for the ADB? I, I think it, 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 makes you, it makes you even more critical uh, because I, I think there, there's sort of an, almost an additional role. It, 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 it means uh, mitigating or emphasizing the mitigation of setbacks as much as in accelerating growth. That becomes our sort of our new compass, right? To help countries invest in, in economic resilience to, to, of course, reduce the pre-existing vulnerabilities and better deal with economic and non-economic shocks that are going to continue to come one after another. And I think there's three really important entry points that we at SCAP see. And, and, and I think there's good alignment with, with, with the direction that, that the ADB has already taken. I mean, the first is, is directing investments to, to a really urgent energy transition that is in line with the Paris Agreement, but that is simply not happening. There's a stubborn reliance on fossil fuels uh, in our region. Uh, and not only will greenhouse gas emissions continue to rise, but also importing countries like Cambodia, Pakistan, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, all of them remain very vulnerable to, to, to rising 
energy prices that have knock-on effects. So getting that investment in decarbonization, and especially in the energy sector, is so critical. But, but these radical transitions that, 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 that we know are needed are still seen to some degree as unfeasible in so many countries in, in our Asia-Pacific region, because our region continues to invest in coal. And with the unraveling sort of energy crisis, or I should probably call it a fossil fuel crisis, there's even more temptation to go back to coal and, 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 and all the rest, regardless of the human toll, the consequences of climate change, all the things that we are aware of and is a, an integral part of ADB's strategy. So I think the energy transition remains the biggest and most challenging opportunity. For, 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 for the M MDBs. And I can only applaud, obviously, your work as Asia Pacific's Climate Bank in investing in the renewable energy future and in the phase out of, of coal. But when you look at, at the figures, look at the SDG progress and the country's own nationally determined contributions, when you look at the regional GHG levels, it's clear that so much more is needed and, 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 and needed very quickly, including helping countries that are so heavily reliant on coal, like Bangladesh, Indonesia, Mongolia, Vietnam, to very quickly accept to move in another direction fast. So that, that, that remains such an important entry point for, 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 for the work. I think the second one, and, and Lucien, I think, mentioned this uh, uh, importantly, is, is the investments in social protection that have actually proven to be the first, and, and for many people in our region, the only line of defense in this pandemic, right, in this crisis. The, the underinvestment in social protection uh, has left uh, half of the region's population to, to essentially fend for themselves in times of crisis, with, with all the backsliding across the SDGs on poverty, on hunger, on inequality, and, and so on. And as long as the region is spending less than half of the global average on social protection, the poorest, the more vulner most vulnerable will Will, will, will inevitably continue to fall deeper into poverty when crisis hits, and the SDGs will remain very much out of reach. Uh, the emergency response measures uh, that was in the presentation during the pandemic, uh, many of which were supported by, by the ADB, from the cash transfers to improving the health facilities, all of this is, is absolutely laudable, but it needs to be locked in with long-term comprehensive universal health care, social protection, Etc. And this is where multilateral investments can surely help to safeguard the critical social investments as countries try to make fiscal space for their own economic recovery. A third and final entry point is, is investing in disaster risk reduction and, and, and in resilience. And uh, this includes, of course, uh, multi-hazard early warning systems that can deal with all of these multiple and colliding risks and, and crises. But it goes much, much further than that. You know, for a region that depends on medium and small enterprises for so much of employment, in a region that depends on smallholder farmers for so much of the food supply, building resilience has to go much further, including to build resilience of farmers most exposed to climate-induced disasters, and supporting MSMEs, many of which are run by women uh, and, and, and form, frankly, the backbone of our economies, but have little financial reserve to cushion through these kinds of shocks. And multilateral development banks are, are uniquely placed to help them to access the finance, to access the markets, and to adopt the sustainable and innovative practices, something that can have knock-on effects uh, on overall productivity, on overall uh, growth. Uh, finally, you know, if countries are to, to invest uh, their way out of the pandemic and the evolving uh, cost of living crisis that is, is here or, 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 or around the corner, uh, is there a, a role for, for all of us? And, 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 what, and how much of, 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 of an emphasis should we, should we put on the issue of debt and debt sustainability? This is, this is a little bit of a difficult, a difficult issue that we're really grappling with at ESCAP. I mean, many countries in our region uh, Armenia, Kazakhstan, uh, Maldives, Pakistan, Samoa, Sri Lanka, Tajikistan, yeah, I think you know the list better than I do, find themselves under multiple stresses from large fiscal burdens, external debt distress, vulnerable banking, equity markets, and the rest of them. And, and to some degree, uh, I think Sri Lanka was, was a little bit of a, a perfect storm in that regard. Uh, financial, I don't know, uh, uh, mismanagement, the climate stress, the pandemic fallout, all coming at the same time. And it, it may not be the last if fiscal consolidation is sort of the priority or the go-to policy 
uh, response. But in all of this, we, like you, are, are, are convinced that the SDGs remain the compass, but not to be picked apart right, in, in, in a one, by one SDG by one SDG way, but in a very holistic way. In a way, we have to, we, we can leave no SDG behind because the, we saw from the pandemic, right, the health and environment and social protection and development, they're all very intimately intertwined. And, and in a way, how can we maintain that 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 that, that uh, cohesion across the SDGs and ensure that that the investments continue to protect the development gains that have happened at a time of of multiplying multiplying uh, crises. Now, I appreciate that in many ways, uh, Bruce. I'm, I'm preaching sort of to the converted because ADB's impressive portfolio makes it not just Asia Pacific's uh, climate bank, but but also to some degree our region's SDG bank. Um, so often, you know, uh, the bank is the trigger for these essential transformations that, that, that as yet, unfortunately, are far too slow to emerge in the countries of Asia Pacific. So, again, thank you for, for, for allowing me to, to join this, this conversation, and I, and I look forward to, to chatting a little bit more uh, uh, on this uh, during our session. Back to you, Bruce. Thanks. Uh... <laughs> Thanks very much, Kevin. Um, fabulous uh, comments. Um, never forget to preach to the converted. Uh, it's a very important thing to do, uh, but very sobering comments. Let's move on to our next panellist, um, because we want to leave some time for questions at the end. Um, and we're going to be joined by, from London, Mark Miller, the Director of Program Development and Public Finance from the Overseas Development Institute. So ODI has produced a, a body of thought-provoking work on the future of the multilateral financial system. That's made the case for reforms that would enable MDBs to respond more effectively to some of the pressing global challenges that impede attainment of the SDGs, including climate change. So, Mark, we'd welcome your reflection on ADB's key achievements and opportunities to strengthen our contribution to some of these uh, critical challenges. Over to you, Mark, please. Thanks, Bruce, and uh, very nice to be here. I'll um, try and stay relatively brief so that we have some time for, for questions at the end. Um, so we've already heard a lot about the, you know, the really difficult context that the Asian Development Bank is operating in. I don't think I need to add further to that. Um, we've also heard concerns around you know, how the SDGs are, are looking like an increasingly distant prospect. I think I'd, while I recognise that all the SDGs remain extremely important, I think in that very difficult macroeconomic context and this very broad um, set of aspirations, I do think it's fair to say that the Asian Development Bank cannot fix everything on its own. And so there is potentially... Um, important choices around where the Asian Development Bank should really focus. How can the Asian Development Bank step up as an institute and contribute? Where should it focus its energies? Um, and I think particularly I want to focus on four ideas how it can step up as an institution to really help make a step change. Uh, I think the first thing to say is, you know, a lot of people will have different views on where the Asian Development Bank should focus, the shareholders would have their views, um, various experts, think tanks. I think it's critically important in this context that the bank continues to listen to client countries to hear what they think is important. It's difficult for client countries to deliver against all 17 SDGs right now. So where should countries focus in the next two to three years? That discussion you know, should be in dialogue, and it's important that we you know, continue to listen to clients. Um, that sort of leads me into to plugging a bit of ODI research, I suppose. We, we recently did a large-scale survey of um, uh, cl client governments to ask them what they thought was important about multilateral development banks. And perhaps if we could just go to the next slide, I think it serves as a useful reminder of the... Uh, I wasn't, <laughs> in fact, expecting to see that slide, but... Um, no problem. I think there, is, there, there was, should be one in there about the, um, 
what the advantages are. Exactly. So, thank, so I think it's important to remember what the core offer of the Asian Development Bank is. And when we ask clients you know, what they see as the main advantages of grants and loans offered by MDBs for the country, the areas that they highlighted as continuing to be particularly important was the ability to fill financing gaps and finance large-scale projects. And I think that offer remains extremely important, and we shouldn't lose sight of that. These are things that capital markets can offer, where money is often you know, volatile, comes in and comes out. We've seen a lot of that in the crisis. Multilateral development banks can support large-scale, long-term investments. And so we really need to be thinking about, you know, how can that uh, offer best be applied and not lose sight of that. So I think that the, th the third point I then want to make related to that, if we, if we recognise that we need to continue to listen to clients, that the offer of... Um, providing long-term finance remains fundamentally important, but also that we need to change, that we need to adapt it to a changing world. And we're hearing that in the commitments to be a climate bank. Well, what does that look like? How practically could the Asian Development Bank do that? And perhaps three thoughts on that. I think, first of all, it's important to think about how can the, the bank contribute to changing the narrative so how can the, we you know, underscore the synergies between development and climate action? How do we, for example, uh, demonstrate that climate change mitigation and adaptation measures don't need to come at the expense of poverty reduction or economic growth? We know that low carbon and climate resilient development will be less exposed to shocks and stresses of all kinds. So I think that's, you know, change the narrative would be important. Changing the approach to technical assistance is something the Asian Development Bank could usefully do. So can the bank support countries to really think about climate smart development strategies? So strategies that offer more energy security, that means less dependence on fossil fuels, um, lower and predictable, more, uh, lower operating costs, so more energy efficiency, no fuel inputs. We really need to think about how we can, how the bank could spell out in very clear terms what climate smart development could look like. I don't think client countries always sort of recognise that at the moment. I think a third uh, practical thing that the bank could be doing is thinking about how it could adapt approaches to the financing instruments it uses. So how does it tailor um, its financing to countries who are particularly exposed to climate shocks? How does it support long-term investments in the energy transition? And how does it tailor its financing instruments to that? Perhaps the fourth final point on uh, what the bank could really be usefully doing at the moment is to lead by example on financial innovation. So, you know, we've heard about the scale of the problems. Um, we've heard how enormous the financing needs are. I think the Asian Development Bank has really effectively taken the lead in the past in thinking about financial innovation, so things like the merging of um, the lending windows. And there's a lot of opportunities now to really be out at the front of the pack again to uh, lead by example in um, implementing some of the recommendations that came out of the independent review of capital adequacy frameworks. I'm not going to get into all the technical details of that right now, but I think it's fair to say that we, you know, we need the, the multilateral development banks to be lending more, given the scale of the needs. And there's a number of solid recommendations out there about how the Asian Development Bank and other MDBs could be thinking about their approach to risk management, which could help unlock additional lending, which is going to be absolutely critical at this time. So just a very quick recap, you know, listen to clients, focus, continue to focus on core strengths, but adapt them to the needs of being a climate bank and lead by example on financial innovation. Thanks all.
Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Mark. That's um, very helpful input and uh, thoughts on some of the things we need to think about in responding to the challenges that we see around us. So, um, our audience, um, feel free to in indicate any questions you'd like to um, to ask of uh, of our speakers. Um, perhaps, perhaps I can begin. One of the one of the things, um, and I could pose this to either Cave or um, or, um, um, or Mark, uh, one of the things that we're seeking to do um, in, in, uh, in the work we're doing um, around the effectiveness of the organisation is to think about um, uh, how we're placed to respond to the challenges that we've got ahead of, ahead of us. And we've got an organisational review underway at the moment. And one of the things we have to get used to is the fact that we're dealing with different different partners, of course. Um, it's not just other MDBs, but we're dealing with the private sector as well, philanthropies, um, many other um, um, potential partners who are contributing to addressing some of these development goals. So, um, Kave, I, I wonder if you've got any particular observation on, on this changing landscape, which used to be perhaps more more completely dominated by the MD, MDGs and uh, multilateral development banks and by bilateral partners, but now sees other other um, contributors, potential contributors and partners coming into the field. Yeah, th thanks, Bruce. I mean, it's 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 a difficult one, but, but the, the, the reality is from any kind of report that you've done, we've done, uh, many others have done, um, what is needed to deliver on the SDGs is trillions and trillions of dollars, right? Or, or a reorientation of, of, of public and private investment at a scale that's that's never been seen before. So, of course, we have to we have to look beyond the the MDBs, right? Of, of course, countries need to look beyond the MDBs, tap into and, and properly use the capital markets, see how to better orient some of the the public finances. Although those uh, I appreciate are very uh, stretched right now. Um, you know, we, we recently had the pleasure of working with, with, with ADB and, 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 and a number of financiers, you know, under this GFANS group that emerged out of COP26, right, the Global Financiers for Net Zero, uh, who, who are basically trying to make real on this promise of having, you know, over a trillion dollars that is available for climate smart investments, but doesn't seem to be flowing into the countries quite as rapidly and doesn't seem to be complementing uh, the, the, the kind of investments that the ADB is, is making, and we're certainly not seeing it in the in the macro numbers, right? In terms of energy transitions, uh, etc. And, and I think so. So the so the so the very long answer is yes. It's critical. It's definitely needed, um, but we haven't quite found the key to it yet. And even at this event that that we ran together, we when we brought the G fans with the countries who had very much investable uh, proposals aligned with Paris. It was hard to get the private sector uh, interested in all of them. It, they often go after the, the, the easier, easier things. And, and this is where maybe what Mark was saying about prioritizing comes in, right? It, it is almost impossible to get the, 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 the private finance interested in, in adaptation and resilience building. Uh, much easier to go for the, for, the, for the mitigation and the energy projects that, that, that have income streams and can be uh, profitable. So this is the landscape and without a question, uh, we, we, we need we need we need to join join forces in in, in that sense for us. Mark, anything on that point? Yeah, but perhaps just to add, I mean, I think it's really important that different institutions recognise their respective strengths and what they're good at. I mean, I think I've already made the point that uh, you know, multilateral development banks are a very effective tool for you know, large scale lending. I think philanthropy has a you know, a, a potentially really useful role in taking risk, providing sort of capital around sort of research and development, doing things that are more difficult for governments or banks to do potentially. I think the private sector, I think Kavos hit the nail on the head, so they can come in at scale where there is a kind of proven model, but are they necessarily, um, you know, particularly effective in across all sectors? No, I think not. So I think it's really about understanding, you know, what institutions are good at and working together to, you know, make the most of those strengths. Thanks. Okay, so um, 
One question from our audience. Um, um, well, an observation that your uh, your point, Nike, on listening increasingly to client countries in, in relation to achieving SDGs was a, um, a well-made point. Um, an another question, would writing off debt issue accelerate achieving SDGs on a premise that more and wise spending are required for building back better? Perhaps, Mark, you could uh, respond to that question. I mean, sure. So I think, obviously, you know, the... Uh, where debt servicing is highly elevated, you know, if there is a way to sort of reduce those costs to free up investment, um, I think everyone would agree that uh, that would be beneficial for development. I think the, the question is how, you know, how to make that happen. Um, and I think there's been a lot of work done around issues like the common framework, which are trying to work out common debt relief me mechanisms. And that maybe starting to see some very, very slow progress on that. But that is an extremely hard uh, process, getting sort of everyone in the room agrees across the private sector, bilateral lenders, the multilateral development banks, who pays, who bears the burden for that. Uh, it's vitally important. We need to keep focus on it, but we could have a whole two hours discussing, you know, what are some of the difficulties, challenges in achieving that. Uh, I probably need to wind up, but uh, Kevin, any last word from you? Uh, no, I mean, look, the, the, the debt issue is, is, is one that's not going to go away right now. You, you can see it in, in our region. And, and, and one part of it is defining better debt sustainability. Uh, and, and, and frankly, you know, it's, I, I don't think we're, we're quite there yet. You can have countries with very high debt. I mean, look at Japan, and, and it's, it's, it could be sustainable in, in some cases. So I think we, we've got to redefine. And then in other cases, we do need the, the innovation that Mark uh, mentioned. Uh, we, we see this move, for for example, to, to debt for climate swaps. I think it holds a lot of promise, uh, but but uh, it, it's it, a lot of details have to be worked out. And every time we we, we host a meeting on that, you know, that the creditors turn, tend not to show up. Uh, so 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 I agree with Mark. We still need to get everyone in the room. Uh, but I also agree that that, that 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 it's important for all of us to set the right tone. I think that's what. Uh, that's what that's what Mark uh, mentioned, and 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 that's what we're trying to do jointly with with ADB, with with UNDP. We have our annual reports. This time it's going to be looking at food, energy, and finance crisis. But it's really to set the narrative about what is possible. And and I hope this time it's going to be even more of a sort of a a solutions report and looks at the, those solution pathways uh, as countries find themselves uh, hit by 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 crisis uh, after after crisis. Well, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Lou. Um, that's been a useful discussion, but I think our time is, uh, is running up. Uh, it's been an interesting looking forward discussion on aid, aid effectiveness. So obviously, I think we're all responding to, in, in a sense, uh, an evolving environment in which some of the issues that, we, that, our, that our DMCs face are becoming deeper, um, interlinked, intractable in many cases. Many of them threaten um, the capability of sovereign nations. And in this context, um, we are acutely conscious here at the ADB that the world needs effective and responsive institutions that enable um, uh, assistance to respond to these crises. We're doing a lot of things as part of an organizational review to put us closer to clients. This was a point that was made by Lark. To engage with private capital in a different way and with other partners. And to really increase our ability to respond to the challenges around us. The sustainable development goals remain relevant. Our strategy 2030 remains the centerpiece of our actions. But we know we need to be more capable um, in responding um, to this environment and, uh, and this discussion, I hope you, has given you a sense of, uh, of that. So um, thank you very much, colleagues, for your contributions, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.